Last week, we looked at the last part of Matthew chapter 27. Uh, Jesus has been crucified. He is now buried. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, they've anointed his body and put it in a tomb. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary have noted where the grave is so that they could come back after the Sabbath and finish anointing the body of Jesus. The chief priests and the Pharisees have gone to Pilate. They've asked for a guard to seal the tomb and to secure it so that the disciples couldn't steal the body and then pretend that Jesus rose from the dead. So the scene is set. Friday has now come to a close as the Sabbath is celebrated from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Jesus has been buried. And now it is early Sunday morning, the first day of the week, according to Jewish customs. So turn to Matthew 28. And after almost eight years, we are finally approaching the end of God, the gospel of Matthew. And uh, praise God. Thank you for those in this with the news that he has risen. He has risen. Let's start there in verse one. I'm going to be reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards quaked from fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Now, in those seven verses, you get a very brief account of the resurrection. And one thing that's helpful, and I've mentioned this already a few times, is we have four gospel accounts. So you can look also at Mark and Luke and John. And, you know, uh, th there's a certain sense where you can harmonize these gospel accounts. And uh, at times it'll be a little challenging because you'll see details that are not mentioned in all of the gospel accounts in the same way. And for some people, they'll say, oh, this shows there are, there are contradictions. Uh, no, not necessarily. Just because you have different perspectives doesn't mean you have contradictions. In fact, one of the things I, I was thinking of doing this after service today is to ask four of you to give a summary of what I just talked about. And I'd be very interested to hear what you would have to say. I don't think we'd hear four exact duplicated responses. But hopefully you have the facts straight. And what we have here in Matthew is just a very direct, sort of straightforward account there's not much added in terms of detail, but he wants us to see certain things. So it's after the Sabbath. They had to quickly bury Jesus on that Friday before the Sabbath started at sundown. If we kind of use our time frame, uh, Jesus died at 3 p.m. And they only had three hours before 6 p.m to get all this stuff taken care of, to anoint his body, to put him in the tomb. And so we see in, at the end of Matthew 27 that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, uh, they note this. And even though it says that Nicodemus had brought a great amount of spices and myrrh to anoint the body, they still wanted to add more themselves. It might not have been too much, but it really was out of their devotion and love for Christ. Now, you look at John 20, verse 1, and this is why you have to look at the parallel accounts to get some of the details straight. Mary Magdalene evidently came first before the rest 
She came early by herself. She saw the stone was rolled away. So she ran to Simon Peter and John and told them that Jesus had been taken out of the tomb and she didn't know where they had taken him. So in John chapter 20, verse 10, Peter and John, they go running. And it's interesting that uh, uh, John notes that he beat Peter. John looks into the tomb. Peter actually goes into the tomb. And they see that the tomb is empty. So they go back to where they're staying. And in the account, it kind of looks like Mary told Peter and John, they ran ahead. They kind of leave her behind. They go look, they take off, and Mary Magdalene comes back. And so she is crying. And she looks into the tomb at that point and sees two angels in white. Now, in Matthew, it only mentions one angel. It doesn't mean there's a contradiction. Matthew is simply highlighting a point. And one of the things that we have to be careful of is to not impose kind of our way of thinking into the story. If you recall Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all approach the life of Christ with a little bit of a different perspective. Matthew is approaching it in writing to the Jews. He's presenting Jesus as king. Mark is writing to the Gentiles. He presents Jesus as a servant. Luke really emphasizes the humanity of Christ. So you see the phrase son of man emphasized a lot. And in the gospel of John, John emphasizes the deity of Christ. But it doesn't mean they're contradicting. They're just presenting different perspectives. Now, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they came to the grave without an expectation of the resurrection. You see, they came to pay their respects. They came to anoint the body. They were so devoted to Jesus they followed Jesus. They actually supported Jesus financially. They were there at the crucifixion, even when the rest of the disciples, except for John, had fled. And they again came to the tomb so that they would pay their respects. Now, in the meantime, it says that there was an earthquake and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. Now, if you've lived in California any amount of time, you know what an earthquake is like. And uh, for those of us who grew up here, when you feel like a slight rumble, it's like no big deal. You know, people who've moved to California and they, they experience an earthquake for the first time and they kind of freak out. Like, oh, no. Like, oh, no, that's just like a 5.0. No big deal. You know, let's hit seven or eight. Then we're talking earthquake. Well, this angel comes, and there's an earthquake. An earthquake had also happened during the crucifixion, too. Now, it says that the angel came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. Now, this is not so that he could let Jesus out. Jesus is already risen. He's rolled away the stone so that they can come and look into it. So that when they come, they can see that the tomb is empty. Now, it says the guards quaked with fear. And it's interesting. It's the same idea of an earthquake. The, there was an earthquake, and then the soldiers had an earthquake. They quaked. They quaked with fear. It says they became like dead men. They fainted. These are soldiers. These are Roman soldiers. These guys were feared. But now that now they are afraid because something has happened that is completely outside of their experience. They've never seen anything like this before. Yeah. Now, Matthew highlights the interaction of the women with this angel who came to roll the stone away. And the first words that he says to them is, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Now, it makes sense. I mean, the soldiers are afraid. These women come and they see the, the, what's laid out. No doubt they are afraid. 
they see this angel, and it says that this angel really stood out. Now, you know, we don't have a picture of this, but no doubt when they saw this angel, they knew that, okay, this is not usual. This is not normal. Now, in John 1.13, when the angel appeared to Zechariah when he was in the temple, and this angel tells Zechariah that he and Elizabeth are going to have a son who's going to make a way for the Messiah, he opens with the same phrase, do not be afraid. And that's in John 1.13. In John 1.30, when the angel appears to Mary to announce that she will bear a son, the angel also says, do not be afraid. In fact, if you look throughout Scripture, even in the Old Testament, there are many times where you see this phrase, do not be afraid. Now, when someone tells you, do not be afraid, it kind of depends who's actually saying that whether you're going to be afraid or not. Because if someone says, do not be afraid, do they give you confidence? Do they have the authority that they could tell you, you don't have to be afraid? Now, when an angel of the Lord tells you to not be afraid, you can be certain you don't have to be afraid. Now, the angels, they had every reason to be afraid. But these women, they did not. Why? Because the angel tells them, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. Just as he said, come, see the place where he was lying. So the angel knew that the women were coming for Jesus. And he tells them, don't be afraid. Why? Because you thought Jesus was dead, but he is alive. He is alive. Now, I'm sure these women, along with the disciples, as they followed Jesus throughout his ministry, they would have heard that Jesus had said that as they go to Jerusalem, he will suffer and die and rise again. Now, we've already looked at the disciples. How did they respond to the, that news that Jesus gave? Well, Peter told Jesus, bad idea. Don't go to Jerusalem. I mean, Jesus made it very clear. This is the plan. We are heading to Jerusalem. And I'm going to suffer and die and rise again. Now, they heard that suffer and die part. And they didn't like it. But you wonder why they didn't consider that last phrase, that he would rise again. Now, as we looked at Matthew 27, the women, the disciples, they must have all been in shock. The disciples are in hiding, except for the apostle John. He is at the crucifixion. But they're in hiding. Why? Because they're afraid that they're next. I mean, if this is going to happen to Jesus, this is going to happen to the rest of us. Now, the women, they had the courage to be at the crucifixion. But now they are at the tomb. The Roman seal has been broken. You see, when a Roman seal was, seal was put on something, if you broke it, it was punishable by death. The stone was rolled away. And the idea of the stone being rolled away, it wasn't just moved a little bit. It was like at a distance. And they see the angel sitting on it. it it's almost a little comical. Because if you think what happened, th this is not what someone would have imagined taking place. And so when the angel speaks to them, he assures them that they do not need to be afraid. And if you go to Luke chapter 2, verse 10, it says the angel of the Lord said this as well again. The angel comes to the shepherds and says, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. A savior is born in the city of David. So when the angel says, do not be afraid, for I have good news. 
The reason why you don't have to be afraid is because there's good news. A Savior is born, Christ the Lord. The good news was that the Savior is born so that he would live and die and rise again. This baby who is wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger would rise again. And he would take the linen wrappings that he was wrapped in in the tomb and he would leave them there. The baby who was born in humble means would rise again in victory over sin and death, fulfilling what he had come to do. As we have looked at in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant had come to die, but now has been risen to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. So the angel makes it very clear. He is not here for he is risen just as he said. You see, Jesus said it many times. It's almost like he's reminding them. Remember, Jesus has said that. He was going to do that. He was going to rise again. And then the angel says, come and see the place where he was lying. Come see for yourself. You know, I think when you read through these narrative accounts, it's almost good to, to use your imagination a little bit. Don't go crazy with it. But imagine being there, seeing the empty tomb, and then the angel says, come in. Look and see for yourself. He's not here. Now, the linen wrappings, they still were in the form of how they had wrapped him. The face mask had been set aside and folded. And so they see this. It must have been such an incredible moment. I mean, they had come out of their devotion and love for Christ to anoint his body. They were still mourning. Instead, they are the first to hear that Jesus had risen from the dead. And they see this empty tomb. And not only that, the angel says, Jesus is going to go ahead of you to Galilee. So go and tell his disciples. And we've already looked at this before. Matthew 26, 32, Jesus says, after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. He had already announced the plan. Jerusalem, suffering, death, resurrection, then Galilee. There is a plan that keeps going. Now, so we need to ask a question here. Why did the disciples, disciples not believe what Jesus was telling them? In fact, why did the disciples even contradict Jesus when Jesus said, these are the things that are going to happen? Why did Peter deny? Why did Peter say, I will never deny you? Why did the disciples say, we will never forsake you? Well, look at John 20, verse 9. John 20, verse 9. It says, for as yet they did not understand a scripture that he must rise again from the dead. I mean, this is from a, a bigger perspective. They didn't get it yet. They didn't understand they didn't know this was the way it was supposed to happen, even though Jesus had been telling them that. It's interesting in John 20, when Peter and John go to the empty tomb, it says that Peter marveled. It says that John believed. John is the first one to get it. Peter hasn't gotten it yet, but he's getting there. And the rest are still hiding. In fact, if you recall, when Jesus reveals himself to them that evening, that Sunday, that first day of the week, Thomas isn't there. So even when the disciples tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And what did he say? Eh, I don't believe you. Until I get to stick my finger in his wounds. I mean, that had to be a very kind of strange thing to say. Why would you want to stick your finger in his wounds? I mean, even if he was there, why would you want to stick your finger in his wounds? But it shows kind of where he was at. It's like, come on, you guys are crazy. I can't believe this. Yeah, I'll stick my fingers with Dan, I'll believe. And I think it's almost humorous when Jesus appears the next time and he says, hey, Thomas, go ahead. 
stick your stick your finger in the wounds. I don't think Thomas stuck his finger in the wounds. He says, my Lord and my God, because he is now overwhelmed with the reality of Jesus has written, risen. Now, so going back to Matthew 28, the angel tells them to go quickly. Go quickly and tell his disciples. So what do the women do? They, they go quickly. It says they left the tomb quickly. And it says that they were filled with fear and great joy as they ran to report to the disciples. So the women do exactly as the angel tells them. They went quickly. They went with some fear. I mean, you've got to understand the emotions of what's going on has to be kind of crazy. But that fear is overwhelmed with a great joy. A great joy. It's interesting in the Greek, the word great is where we get the word mega. So you could say that they were filled with a mega joy, not just a little joy, not just a good amount of joy, but a great joy. This is reminiscent of Luke 2 again, when the angel says, I bring you good news of great joy. Now, why is there great joy? that could be experienced. Well, you have to look at it from the perspective of these women. They have witnessed what they could never have imagined. Going back to the crucifixion, the one in whom they had placed all their hopes is hanging on a cross. His body is torn apart. He has been whipped. He's been tortured. He has blood streaming from his face because of the thorns that were pressed upon his brow. Jesus was tortured. He was humiliated. He was crucified. If you can imagine seeing that with your own eyes, I mean, these women must have been just traumatized and even when they go back to the tomb because they want to anoint the body there is no great joy there is great sorrow they're going to anoint a dead body but now they have heard good news and that's why it results in great joy. They know that Jesus has risen. It's interesting, the bookends, and I think it's why it's almost appropriate to just be able to say we can talk about the resurrection at Christmas because at the birth of Christ, you see some parallels. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 10, when the wise men, they go to Herod, and they're asking, where is the king of the Jews to be born? It says there in chapter 2, verse 10, it says that these wise men saw a star that led them to where Jesus was. And it says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Why? Because they were going to see the king. These women were overcome with a great joy because this was the greatest news that they could have ever heard. The one whom they had loved and worshiped was alive. His promise to rise again had come true. He would continue on with his plan. He would meet the disciples in Galilee He was not finished in that he was going to then give a mission to them to continue the work. In Luke chapter 24, verses 52 and 53, after Jesus has ascended, Luke writes, and they were worshiping him. That afterwards they worshiped him, returning to Jerusalem with great joy. And we're continually in the temple blessing God. And I thought this would be something 
that would be helpful for us to look at as an application point. If you know the risen Savior, if you know Jesus and the power of his resurrection, do you experience a great joy? Not just a little bit of joy, not even a good amount of joy, but a great joy. And the reason why we can experience a great joy is because of the resurrection of Christ. It means that Jesus is who he said he was. You see, when Jesus rose again from the dead, it fulfilled everything that the scriptures foretold. It also meant that Jesus accomplished what he said he would. It means that Jesus has now purchased the blood price of salvation so that those who would believe in him and repent of their sins and trust in him alone for the forgiveness of sins, it means that the penalty has been paid. It means that the power of sin has been broken. And it means that there's a promise of heaven. It means that there is nothing in this world that has power over me. I don't need to be held in bondage. I don't need to stay sad. I don't need to live in fear. I don't need to be depressed. I don't need to be despairing because I have something in Christ now that overcomes all of that. So when the women heard the angels say that Jesus was risen, they couldn't help but be filled with a great joy. They were rejoicing over the good news. Now, this joy is not something that you can make up on your own. It is a supernatural joy. It is one that can only be experienced when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's something that is not dependent on your circumstances. You know, I think maybe most of you would know, I'm a very emotional person. I get very easily discouraged. And uh, when you dwell on your feelings, you could end up saying and doing things that you'd regret. And that's because you're letting those circumstances drive your actions. When we talk about having joy, it's not that you're jumping up and down and, you know, laughing hilariously. That's not what joy is. But there is a certain deep-rooted celebration that is grounded in an objective truth, and that is the resurrection of Christ. So when you think of Philippians 4.4, where it says, where Paul tells the Philippian church, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. You could say it this way. Rejoice in the risen Lord always. Because in this, I can always rejoice. Because the resurrection is a fact. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. It's true. And because of that, I can rejoice no matter what else is going on in life, no matter what I'm feeling, no matter how hard things can get, because the resurrection of Christ is something so powerful, it transforms how we live. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1, and we've looked at this a number of times. I've prayed this a number of times, in fact, You know, we look at uh, the prayers of Paul, and in the book of Ephesians, there are a few prayers which we can see as a pattern for us to follow. And starting in verse 15 of chapter 1, it says, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the full knowledge of him, so that you, the eyes of your heart having been enlightened, will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of the might of his strength. 
which he worked in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. That is something that can only happen when the eyes of your heart have been enlightened, that you would understand the surpassing greatness of God's power toward you. If you believe in Christ, and then you understand that God worked in Christ by raising him from the dead, there is no greater authority or power that someone can exercise. I mean, think about this. Uh, for those of you who are younger, maybe you don't think about this as much. Uh, we're all going to die one day. I mean, every day people are dying. I mean, I was just reading a couple of days ago of uh, uh, Demarius Thomas, a uh, football player. Mid-30s. Dead. Taking a shower. And he died. That was my thought while I was taking a shower. I could die like right now. Find my body there. We know people die. We, we mourn because we see what death does. And it seems so final. It seems so conclusive. And that's why we look at the resurrection of Christ and we understand that there's a great power that we can't even begin to imagine. And it's a power that one day as Christians, we will experience as well when we are resurrected. I think that's going to be crazy. I mean, it's, it's so hard to even imagine. I mean, for me, this is just my perspective. Everything is downhill right now. It's the body is just going to slowly decay and die. That, that's, that's just reality. I'm not going to get any better. I don't think I'm ever going to play basketball again. It's okay. But there's not a whole lot to look forward to. If you don't have the hope of the resurrection of Christ. It is the resurrection of Christ the fact that Jesus rose from the dead calls us to rejoice. Now, the angel says, go tell his disciples. That's the second point. Look at chapter 20, verse 7. It says, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and report to my brothers to leave for Galilee. And there they will see me. I just did a little overlap here in terms of verse 7. Because I wanted to highlight something again. It says, the angel says, go quickly. In verse 8, it says they left the tomb quickly. And so they want to go tell the disciples. And on the way, it says that here in verse 9, and behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. This is their first encounter with Jesus. It's very interesting that it's almost like as they're running to the disciples, Jesus kind of shows up and says, Hi. It's a very common greeting that's being used here. We might ask, why did Jesus do that? Well, maybe he was trying to kind of not make it too crazy. But as soon as they recognize him, what does it say? It says that they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Now, they already heard the news from the angel. Jesus has risen. You don't think they're looking forward to see Jesus? I mean, you can only imagine what they're imagining. The last time they saw Jesus, he is bloodied. He had a spear thrust through his side. He is dead. They've seen him get anointed. 
for burial. They recognize Jesus. They immediately go and they fall at his feet and they worship him. There is no hesitation. And Jesus says in verse 10, again, do not be afraid. You know, there is something, when you keep hearing this phrase, do not be afraid. There is only one group of people that can actually truly not be afraid. And those are the ones who follow Christ. Now, Jesus says, do not be afraid. Go and report to my brothers to leave for Galilee. And, and it's interesting that he uses the word, my brothers. Because the last time we know what the disciples did, what did they do? Well, Judas betrays him. Peter denies him. And the rest of them abandon him. And so when Jesus tells the women, go tell and report to my brothers. That's kind of a big deal. It's a reassurance. It's letting them know, you're my brothers. Okay, you messed up a little bit. Okay, you, you messed up a lot. But you're still my brothers. And I want you to meet me. The plan is still on. We're going to meet in Galilee. You're going to see me there. Now, it doesn't mean they're not going to see him at all until they get there. In fact, they're going to see him that night. But there's something about the plan. There's a plan in place. And we're going to look at that in two weeks in what we know as the Great Commission. You see, Jesus did what he had to do. But now it's almost as if he's like, you know what? I have a mission for you because of what I've done. And we're going to move forward. Now, you know, it's kind of sad. In Luke 24, 11, when the women go to share with the disciples, it says that their words appeared to them as nonsense and they were not believing in them. Imagine if you're the women, you've actually seen Jesus and Jesus has given you something to tell them. And the disciples are kind of like this. Yeah, right. You're crazy. We don't believe you. How must have those women felt? They're like, no, no, you're crazy. We actually saw Jesus. Okay, you haven't seen him yet, but we saw him. And he told us to give you the message. So we're giving you the message. Now, when Jesus appears to the disciples that evening in Luke 24, 37, it says initially that they were startled. They are frightened because it's almost like they thought they saw a ghost. So they weren't quite ready yet. But going back to the women, they were told to go quickly and tell the disciples. And that's what they did. Now, the word go here is the same word, uh, same root that is used in verse 19 in go, therefore, and make disciples. It's a participle. And so the idea is like, as you're going, in fact, you should be going. In fact, go, 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 go. You should be going right now because you need to go and tell the disciples. Going, you tell. The Great Commission is going, you make disciples. And so the women, what did they do? It says that they went quickly. You know, they didn't talk about it. They didn't say, let's pray about it, whether we should go or not. You know, maybe we should kind of have a discussion, maybe work through logistics. You know, I got my schedule. No, everything else was set aside. They went quickly. The angel said, behold, I have told you this. It's almost as if to say the angel is saying very clearly, do you hear what I've told you? 
Now go, go and tell them. And I really respect these women. They were unhesitating in their obedience to the command. Everything else in life was set aside. They went to tell the disciples that Jesus had risen from the dead, that they were to plan to meet him in Galilee. We're going to look at this when we look at verses 16 to 20. But the command to make disciples, and it says going, you should be going and doing this. In fact, you should be doing this now. Like right away. Like quickly. I wonder how it is that maybe we excuse ourselves from being obedient to the command to go. You know, the angel of the Lord tells these women to go, so they go. Jesus says, go. What do we do? Would we be so quick to tell the story of Jesus as these women did? I mean, the disciples didn't even believe their story, but they didn't fail to do their part. In verses 11 through 15, we see a false narrative. It says, now while they were on their way, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and took counsel together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while, you, while we were asleep. And if this is heard before the governor, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. Now, it's interesting. Ma Matthew is writing years later, this gospel account, and he's saying this is the story that is being told still. Now, there are a couple of points that are, I think are very noteworthy to consider. These soldiers, they were there for the earthquake. They saw an angel appear. They saw the stone was rolled away. Now, these are supposed to be Roman soldiers, the best of the best. They were not supposed to leave their post upon pain of death. If they left the tomb and something happened, they would die. So they go to the religious leaders because they knew that they needed someone to cover for them or else they die. So these religious leaders, they hear the story. And if you imagine again, the chief priests, the Pharisees, they're, they're listening to the soldiers tell them, this is what happened. We were guarding the tomb. There was an earthquake. I mean, even if there was a rotation, you better believe that if there was an earthquake, the rest of it would have woken up because there's an earthquake. And then they see the angel descend, roll the stone away, and he is looking pretty bright. They couldn't miss him. And as they tell the religious leaders, how do they respond? It says that they took counsel together. And then they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. They paid them in silver. It's the same word used for the 30 pieces of silver that Judas Iscariot was paid. It's coming from the same source too, the temple treasury. And they told the soldiers to lie said, you are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. The soldiers know that's not true. And if you think about it, do you think these disciples are ready to go and take on Roman soldiers, move a heavy stone, and try to steal the body? No, they are hiding because they are afraid that they're going to die. Now, the religious leaders tell the soldiers, even if it's reported to the governor, Pilate, they'll take care of them. They'll win him over. They'll keep them out of trouble. Now, the soldiers, they had to love this deal. 
They make money. They're not going to get in trouble. But here, here are some of the questions I, I thought of as I was reading through this. Wasn't there anything that happened in the heart of the soldiers as they witnessed what happened? Wasn't there some sense where because this was supernatural, this was something that they could not explain on their own, do you think that there was even just a little bit where they were challenged to consider that who was this person, Jesus? But we don't hear anything. Not only that, they are told, tell the story that you fell asleep. You let a bunch of uneducated peasants come and take advantage of you. Roll the stone away. Steal the body without waking you. That sounds preposterous. But I think what's even more sad is the religious leaders. They hear this report from the soldiers that something miraculous had happened. Jesus had risen from the dead. You would think that after hearing throughout the whole ministry of Jesus, that at least at this point, maybe they'd be sober enough to actually consider the truth. But nothing had changed for them. They had consistently shown throughout the ministry of Jesus that they hated him. They wanted to get rid of him. They wanted to murder him. So they pay off the soldiers. And it says that it was a large amount. They had to make it worth it for the soldiers to buy into the story. But how could these religious leaders be so hardened in their hearts to deny a miracle? I think here's the point. You might have even heard someone say, if I see a miracle, then I'll believe in Jesus. And that's not true. There were plenty of people who saw miracles. I mean, you just look throughout scripture. I mean, look at the story in Exodus of the Israelites who witnessed the miraculous over and over and over again through the 10 plagues. I mean, that had to be crazy. Think about the plague of frogs. Can you imagine frogs everywhere? Like there's no denying. Something's weird here. There are frogs everywhere. And then the frogs all die. And it says that there was a great stink. Unmistakable. They saw God do the miraculous. In fact, probably the biggest thing that he saw was the splitting of the Red Sea. Like that, that would be crazy. Even after that, they still rebel and choose to reject God. So that's why it's very clear a miracle will not necessarily change anything, even resurrection from the dead. In Luke 16 31, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, they both die. Lazarus is in paradise. Rich man is in hell. He's burning. He asks for some water. He's suffering. He's tormented. So he asks Abraham to send Lazarus to his brothers to warn them. And Abraham says, they have Moses and the prophets. If they won't be persuaded by them, they would not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. And it's almost as if to fulfill that parable, in John 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, and the chief priests, they want to kill Lazarus. It is the same thing today. People will suppress the truth, even when given evidence, even when there's every rational and logical argument that is given, they would rather reject the truth instead of submitting their lives to Christ. So we shouldn't be surprised if there were those who are eyewitness of Jesus, if they could reject Jesus, it's no surprise people would reject Jesus today. People will do anything to explain away the gospel truth. There's something called the swoon theory. Someone came up with this. 
that Jesus actually didn't die on the cross. He just fainted and was unconscious, and he looked dead. So when they put him in the tomb, the coolness of the tomb revived him. And he busted out of the tomb as the conquering hero. That's what we call stupid. I mean, these are scholars who would come up with stories like this. I mean, it's just incredulous. People would rather make up fairy tales instead of accepting the truth. Now we understand that it takes the intervention of the Holy Spirit to open the eyes that are blind. You see, even the disciples didn't understand, even after hearing Jesus share time and time again, they needed a divine intervention to open the ears that were deaf, to soften and break the hardened hearts that were hardened. You see, when we pray for someone, we have to remember we have a responsibility to share the gospel, but it is only God who can open the hearts to save. Well, the last point is an application point, Christmas and the resurrection. It is appropriate that we're talking about the resurrection now during Christmas time, because from a human perspective, it starts with the birth. John MacArthur says, from beginning to end, Scripture presents God as Savior, and the culmination of his saving work began with the birth of Jesus. We celebrate Christmas because that is where we see God radically intervening by sending his own son to take on human flesh so that he would fulfill the calling to be Savior. Steve Lawson says, Jesus did not come to create a holiday. He was born to die for sinners. Matthew 1.21, and, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So it is good to celebrate Christmas, because it is good to remember that this plan starts with the birth, but it doesn't stop there. It is the resurrection of Christ that puts Christmas in proper perspective. You see, without the resurrection, Christmas becomes meaningless. We got 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. It says, now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do you some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. In verse 19, it says, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. You know, in some ways, I think there there are people that are okay with Christmas if you just leave it at Christmas. Christmas is nice. We like the little baby Jesus. Just stay a baby, Jesus. We don't want to hear this other stuff about being Savior, dying for our sins, that we deserve to go to hell. That's why you came. No, no, we don't like that part. We like sharing gifts, having good food, and celebrating Christmas. We see if you don't have the res resurrection, Christmas becomes meaningless. The work is incomplete apart from the resurrection. The resurrection of Christ is what crowns the work of Christ for which he came. In Philippians 2, when it says that Jesus took on the form of a man and humbled himself to, being, to becoming a baby, to then growing as a child, and then as an adult, he still humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. But then he rose again. You see, the, the whole of the story is the birth, the life, the suffering, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's the work Jesus came to do to save us. 
So it is good for us to consider the, re consider the resurrection of Christ because the totality of the work of Christ is the gift of Christ himself to us. Everything that he has done is so that he would give us the gift of eternal life.